welcome to an epic conversation. Sorry about that video. Uh, shared the wrong video there. Oops, uh, technology, I guess. Um, so welcome to epic conversation number 14. Um, and looking forward to this one. Um, it's a slightly different um, uh, conversation. Um, we've had a lot of property conversation, property investors. And um, this is a property conversation, but it's with um, uh, it's sort of following what I've been talking about a lot is entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship in property. And um, Alexandra Proctor has joined us this morning from Dicks Connect um, to have a chat about um, their business, uh, her experiences, um, and uh, what I refer to in the invites that went out, the enthusiasm and optimism around entrepreneurship and business in South Africa. So um, welcome, Alexandra, and thanks for joining me today. Hey, Grant. Um, so excited to be here. I haven't done a talk in a while, and it's since the whole lockdown. So it's so cool to have these conversations again. Um, I'm stoked. Cool. So um, just if you just want to give a quick introduction and then um, we'll sort of get straight into uh, the entrepreneurship space. Uh, by myself or the company? Yeah, good. Okay. No, yourself. Let's do yourself. Uh, so I am Alexandria. I'm the CEO and co-founder of digsconnect.com. Uh, I started the company when I was a student at UCT. I didn't mean to start a company. I just started a project when I was a student at UCT. Uh, just to solve a problem that I'd been facing. I just couldn't find off-campus accommodation for myself when I was in Cape Town and my friends kept complaining about it. And when I was in the SRC, my portfolio was off-campus housed. And everyone was like, how do you find a place to stay if you're a student? Um, and so I started a little website just called Digs Connect uh, as a project. And that thing grew into something way bigger than I had planned, uh, which is now the largest student accommodation marketplace um, on the African continent, actually, which is super cool. That's the same. And, and just uh, let's define large quickly. How many thousand beds have you got uh, listed or have you had listed recently on, on the site? Sure. So we're around, at last count, about 70,000 beds across South Africa. Um, we'd started in Cape Town, uh, just because myself and my co-founders were all ex-UCT, um, and then started going to Stellenbosch, and then the car tank just like overtook completely. I mean, there are so many students. Joburg and Pretoria, especially Pretoria is just, it's buzzing. Um, and that whole school of stretching between, so like Midrand Centurion and then Pottestrum, um, which I never knew existed until recently, um, became one of like our best markets and absolutely love Potch now. And then, yeah, pretty much everywhere. I mean, Bloemfontein, Grandstown, PE, where there's a university, where there's a private college, where there's a cooking school or any sort of student that's pursuing like a, um, a high qualification, uh, we just start popping up there. So. Amazing. Cool. So, I mean, you said, like I said, it was just a, a small project and, and I've, I've written down here you know, a whole lot of questions I want to sort of get into, but let's just um, sort of start and, and let's just get the, the um, uh, sort of the elephant out of the room quickly. What are you guys doing during lockdown to keep yourselves busy? So, funny enough, actually, this time we, we don't really have much traffic. So, this is a very seasonal business. It runs with the academic year. So, um, you know, students kind of start looking for a place to stay, depending on the market, like Stellenbosch is very early. People start looking like... July, August, September for the following year, um, just because you know there's so much demand in Santa Barbara, not really enough beds generally. Um, Cape Town kind of follows that. People start looking around November, December, um, but January's our busiest month. So generally, we absolutely are like force the wards, crazy. Everyone's online. We've got students calling us, we've got parents calling us, because universities calling us. Downs are listing. It's just like absolute carnage between like for that month. Um, February as well, because most lectures uh, universities only open around 14th of February. So we're really, really busy then, and everything kind of goes towards that like high season. Um, and then after that, it drops off a lot. So we have like we have like a little bit of movement in between that. So like you know now historic like last year would have like a few people moving around or like second semester. But we generally don't actually have much movement now, anyways. So what we use this time of the year for is to build any new features that we kind of piloted in the last season. Um, for example, like this last season, we piloted um, our payment system for the first time. Um, with like a small subset of our landlords and that worked really well. So now what we're doing is we build up the features in the tech um, and plan for the next season. So we'll look at, you know, what were our strategic goals we want to like, achieve this year and then for like the 2020, 2021 year, um, like season for us, and then kind of build technology for that and get everything ready for that. And it's quite nice having these like on off periods. It allows us to like a, kind of like a deep clean of our tech um, and of our branding, kind of see like, are we on track with our goals? And yeah, just make like the right decision, which is quite nice. So, oh, I think, sorry, go back to the question, completely off track there. So go back to your question about coronavirus <laughs> is that it hasn't actually changed a lot for us because we were planning on doing this, um, these builds anyways, you know? So like we had planned for our season to kind of things start quieting down when it came to March. Um, so the timing was, I mean, obviously the timing has been horrible for everyone. This is terrible, but for us, it wasn't actually affect too much. 
and being you know tech-based business we managed to do the move to online fairly seamlessly um when the first announcement came out by the president before the lockdown started just saying you know be careful um, we actually decided to go remote then just so that everyone felt a bit more safe because no one really knew there was not much data back then i mean this was like what, like seven weeks ago there wasn't much data out on you know the the deadliness of the virus or 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 just anything really about it. So we decided to close the office and have everyone work remotely. And then we spent like a day just making sure that everyone was set up. Everyone had like computers, everyone had access to the internet, and they had phones, it could work. Um, they had like several little workstation at home. Um, and once we'd done that, then it's pretty much just been working from home, working remotely, um, and using like some really cool tools to do that. So we use um, Slack, which is, I think everyone's using Slack right now, it's super cool. Um, we use Google Hangouts and we just had meetings like, all day throughout the day. A lot of our work is project based. We work together as a team. Um, we do a lot of like just check ins with each other to so trying to keep some sort of company culture going. So checking in, making sure that everyone is like um, okay. Obviously, it's a very stressful time for everyone. It's like it's, everyone feels a lot of anxiety, I think, right now. So just kind of being there for each other um, and checking in with each other, just talking about this crazy time we're living through is something that we also like take quite seriously. That's awesome. So um, I uh, uh, watched, I said to you, I watched the heavy chef talk that you did uh, last, I think it was August, you did the, the talk and you spoke about um, sort of your team and your co-founders and um, Brendan and Greg, but, um, and, and something you, you spoke about which sort of came to the fore was culture in your business and you spoke about uh, in, in the talk about giving each other a hug because you're having a or group hug and anything else. And then you sort of uh, see how you sort of frame, um, even on your LinkedIn profile, how you put your position um, in most of the universe and, and sort of things. So it seems like culture is quite a big part of things connecting what you guys are doing um, within the business. Yeah, definitely. I think just the way it kind of started, I mean, like you know, how we grew the company, it was like myself and then like, you know, my friend at Varsity and then we started recruiting within our network. So people that we knew and friends that we knew and because we were all of a very similar age, uh, you know, we're all like in our early mid twenties. Um, it's just like a, a matter of just, you know, kind of growing so organically and, trying to keep as much as possible where it literally kind of felt like a digs itself like almost all of us lived at digs at university and it kind of became like that where our office was like you know the classic kind of startup space is bean bags and pizza and our fridge is stocked with like beer and i mean one thing that's really cool about our company is that it's got a really like it's yeah i don't know it's crazy how company starts to really like the culture of the company is just like the reflection of the people that work there and for some reason people that seem to be attracted to come join us um have like a really great sense of humor so like everyone is like really funny at our company, which is great. So like we have our, like, we're on our Slack channels, we have to create a like, specific channel just for banter because like we couldn't actually discuss work things. That's not making a joke. And we have like on our WhatsApp groups, it's always like memes being sent. Um, and I think it helps a lot with like, you know, reducing stress or reducing any anxiety. It's just like a well-timed joke at the right time, especially during these crazy times. We just like diffuse so much. I think like bad vibes is kind of going on right now. Um, not only about the, you know, the virus, but about the, obviously the economy is in, is in a very serious situation um and i think everyone's being affected everyone has you know parents or, or partners or um or siblings or friends that you know have lost jobs and so i think just trying to keep like morale up i think is like is is super important um and so in our company because we're fortunate enough to keep operating we still you know have a market we still have a business going kind of keeping that like really good like a good vibe going you know the jokes going kind of like that like that, that awesome like kind of not laid back but um just like, yeah, it's like student-y, digsy vibe that we had, keep, you know, keep that going. Yeah, so it's important, and I think something that sort of comes out of that is also keeping the fun in the business and, and having fun being an entrepreneur, um, ultimately. Yeah. yeah, I think you have to enjoy what you're doing, absolutely. I mean, you spend, we spend most of our adult lives, uh, lives working, so you have to, like, enjoy it, and sometimes the work you have in front of you isn't necessarily the best thing in the world, it's like, then you just kind of, like, a task you might be assigned with right now is just like a bit of a slog. Um, but doing with awesome people that you really enjoy being with and like making it fun and I think also people can pick up if you enjoy what you're doing or if you're just like miserable and so like if you're dealing with clients um, or you're trying to like get people involved with like you know your, your, your mission or we want to do marketing or people teach your platform and you're putting out a message there which kind of like I think I think people can always kind of pick up on your authenticity like if you're being real or not and I think if you authentically are miserable <laughs> like it's, it's not like a really, it's not a nice thing to engage with. So you ping like, a, like this grim, I shouldn't get through it. Like, wow, this is the worst. Like no one wants to like engage with that. You know, you know, like, I think, I mean, I could be wrong here. I feel like you won't have the best time, you know, getting clients or, or kind of, yeah, like being con con compelling or convincing that your product is worth using because like, 
if you aren't that excited about yourself. So if you really are excited about what you do, if you really think it's meaningful, if you really think that it's, it's like profound, it's going to help people, there's a good value proposition to what you're doing. Uh, if you truly believe that, then you can show it with what you're actually doing. Uh, I think that's, yeah, I think that's the foundation of perhaps like a, you know, a good business. So I'm, I'm going to sort of ask about your team and your partners in a moment, but just a reminder for everybody, if you do want to chat, use the chat box. And if you do have questions that you want me to put to Alexandra, just put them into the Q&A section and I'll go through them as we uh, get through the conversation this morning. So um, you mentioned that you spend most of your adult working life um, uh, or your adult life working, so you've got to have fun and enjoy what you're doing. But that also comes with uh, partners and you sort of chosen, and I mentioned Brendan and Greg earlier. Um, and, and how important have they been as part of your team? And then one step further, you guys raised funding um, about a year ago now, um, 12 million rand, uh, first round funding, seed funding. Yeah. And, and I know it's important for, uh, for a tech business like yours to raise funding, but um, how important was it for you to have the right person funding you, so selecting that funder? I mean, yeah. they come with the money, but you've got to choose them. So, so yeah, so, two more questions, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I'll start with the partners first. I think everything kind of starts with that. Like, you know, business partners, from my experience, can like make or break a company. Like before I partnered with Greg and Brennan, I kind of, I was working alone and then I kind of worked with someone and that didn't work out with someone else. So I had like a few failed partnerships um, trying to get this off the ground because like, at least you're like, I don't know, a savant or one in a billion, like chances are you can't be good at everything. There's probably one or two things that you're brilliant at, another like three or four that you're like, okay at, and a few things that you're absolutely dreadful at. And I think that like being honest about that, owning that as quickly as possible is like a good thing. Um, like I think I'm quite aware of the things that I'm good at and I get reminded daily of the things that I'm bad at, <laughs> which is good because you get to find people that can kind of complement that. And I think you can find something that can complement your shortfalls and you also really enjoy being with them. You guys get on despite how different you are. I mean, that is like a golden combination. And um, for example, like when Greg joined, like Greg is just like, he's brilliant. I think like once a generation, a guy like Greg is, is born. He's just... First of all, we got on really well. Like we just had like the like we just get on, you know, we the same sense of humor and the same outlook on life, the same kind of like ethics about how to do business. Um, we just got on, we knew each other from varsity, we're both in the SRC. And everything that I'm really bad at, he's really good at. And everything that he's bad at, I'm good at. For example, like I'm not really organized. So I like have these big ideas and I like do these things and I want to do like a million things at once and I go a million miles an hour and I kind of just like go, 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 go and leave all the details in the dust. Whereas Greg is like completely detail orientated. And he's just like, loves to put things in like Excel sheets and I like have a plan and like timelines and like, he's very like by the book and like things must be very organized. So, I mean, I'll go off and do something like crazy. Um, and sometimes it'll work and sometimes it won't work. And then he'll come along and kind of like make sure that it's sustainable and actually put like a business plan behind it and be okay, cool. How can we actually keep this like this momentum going, which is fantastic. So that kind of really, like that was a fantastic, you know, skill set. And Brendan as well, when he joined the two of us, like he just was like this perfect fit to like, and we became like this tripod of awesomeness because he just, again, like the three of us just, we get on so well, which is like, so, I don't know if it's real or not, but I feel like it is. I mean, how many partnerships, how many businesses fail because of a failed partnership, which I think is also like the worst reason for a company to fail. I think the company fails because the market shifts or, or so if something goes wrong with like the business, like that's understandable. Like, you know, like, you know, it should happen. You know, companies do fail sometimes for legitimate reasons. If a company fails because the partners were fighting, I feel like that's just like, that's not a good enough reason, you know, like you have to be able to like, to deal with that quickly head on. And like, that's something you actually can, you kind of worry about being mature. And I think, you know, the three of us kind of like are the bedrock of this company in a way. And so having us, the fact that we get on so well, is just like the luckiest thing in the world. So when Brendan joined and we just was like the perfect fit and not only do we spend all day together, you know, in the office, but also go for dinner, you know, in the evenings together, we love going to Pasatinas and getting pizza or um, we we'll go away for weekends together. You know, we just got on so well. And I mean, so Brendan was like the tech genius behind Dix Connect. And he brought his skill sets and he's also like extreme methodical um, and has like the tech knowledge that, that Greg and I kind of lacked. And so that just, I mean, it's, I, I can't overstate how important it is to have partners, to have the right partners to make it come to life. I think that perhaps after, you know, many more years when I've, I've garnered enough experience, I could perhaps try, you know, start a company alone. Um, but in your, for your first company, your first time kind of doing all this stuff, um, there's so much to learn. And now after being in this for a few years, I've realized just how much I still don't know. And I think you need a little bit of recklessness to start a company when you're young because you don't actually know how much you don't know. 
uh, and now I, I kind of have more of a grasp of how much I don't know. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, I really, I really don't know a lot. Uh, so having people around you that know a little bit more really does help you. And I think a little ignorance does help because you don't want to get stymied by the fear. You don't want to be like, oh my gosh, I know nothing. How do I do any of this? Um, because you really can learn from most, but as you go, um, and every, as long as you keep your eyes open, every day is a lesson. And so the team is crucial. And then from that, I mean, every person we brought onto our team, um, you know, Tristan and Adam and Ashley and Miles and Kyle and, and John Dean and all these, and Yasha and all these people joining our team right now, it's just, they are as important. I mean, all of them bring their own like viewpoint, their own perception, their own, um, their own way of seeing this, their point of things that we like, no one can like kind of have brought up. And I think giving people as much responsibility as possible on the team um, and letting them just like own the mission and own the brand and fly with it. You just see the most incredible human creativity come alive. You give people the space, they will surprise you with like their brilliance every time. You just like, people are amazing. And I think that, you know, every time we bring someone on, because we think that they have the potential to be like extraordinary and, and they are just like, it just reminds me that humans are incredible and like humans ability to like overcome and to adapt and to build solutions. Uh, it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. And so the team is everything. I think that you can't change the world by yourself. Absolutely. You absolutely can't. But if you like have a mission that you believe in and you find people that also believe in that mission, then it's just, it's so cool. I mean, like the scale and the pace at which you can introduce solutions, like the kind of stuff that the team's building now, the tech we're building. I'm just like in awe. I, mean, I have to keep up with these guys. I'm just like, whoa, like we have meetings and they show me the stuff they're doing. And I'm just like, what? Like, that is so cool. So the team is, yeah, it's everything. Um, and I think also hold each other to your cut. Like we're quite hard on each other. Um, like, especially Greg, he's kind of like our, our chief whip. And he just like, cracks the whip a lot you know if work's not good enough he'll just like lay down the long arm of the law and everyone like goes running and brendan we call brendan the hulk sometimes because like when work isn't done fast enough he just like blows his top at you. <laughs> so like we are quite hard on each other um and if work is substandard we don't we don't hold back on each other no i mean we can be quite brutal with the bad work we also really celebrate good work um and we really just like we let people take like all the glory for the good stuff they've done so it's an environment where if you want to shine and you want to, you know, achieve a lot and you want to kind of like get your name out there, then that's the right environment for you. Um, it's not an environment if you want to be safe or you kind of just want to be like a little, I don't know, like kind of like go with the flow, so some of the wall type thing. We're not a, we're not wall sitters, you know, we go for it. And then getting into your second question about the investors. Um, so investment is, oh, there's a lot also about investment that I didn't know before going into it. And now that I've come out of investment round, um, yeah, I, I realized how incredibly lucky we are. Like I went, we went in sort of so naive. And I think I've heard a lot of stories about entrepreneurs that um, went in the same amount of naivety and came with a very raw deal. And I just think how lucky we are also that we found such cool investors. Like the guys we met were just like brilliant. And I often, you know, people ask for advice. And so I often say it's kind of like dating in a way, like a partnership is basically a marriage. You know, you spend a lot of people, a lot of time with these people. It's your investors or your business partners. You're spending a lot of time. You have a shared bank account. Um, your destinies are kind of tied together. It's, it's, it's quite an intense relationship. And so when you meet investors, it's kind of like this dating. When you get to know each other and you kind of understanding, you know, what, what's your outlook for this company? Um, what's your outlook around around the markets, around the things you could do to date in the company, the strategy about expansion, about uh, monetization, around, like all these different ideas. Um, but also it's kind of like this intangible like vibe. It's the same as like, you know, you can meet someone who like when you're dating, who like checks all your boxes and be like, this is the right person for me, but then there's just no vibe. And the same with the investor, you can say, we want an investor that has these contacts, this amount of money, this kind of like equity shareholding, whatever it is, but it can just be like no vibe. And so you have to kind of like, when we met out, when we met the guys who ended up investing in Digs Connect, it was just like from the first meeting, I remember we were sitting around having coffee and we just could not stop talking. It was just like electric. We're just like, we want to do this. And this person was like, that's incredible. Like, you know, completely on board with that. And we have contacts here, we can help you out. And, and it just was like, it was so exciting. And like, it's like, it's like, it was a meeting. It just kind of felt like all the possibilities in the world just opened up to us. And, and they felt like they had found this team that could really bring a project to life. Um, and so absolutely it's the right people. And so of course, capital is very helpful. Um, you can use capital to, to spend on marketing. You can use capital to hire and extend your team to, to branch to new markets. Um, and that is, you know, obviously a huge part of our fundraising, but more than that, it's the contacts, the network, it's the expertise, it's the brain trust you get access to the fact that you can pick up a phone and call some of the top minds in the country and be like, I'm facing this issue right now. Like, what should I do? 
and you know someone who you know someone you'll call will be like well, i've actually been through this a hundred times before and you go do this and this and this and then you'll figure it out and like you know call me again tomorrow once you've had this conversation we'll check in again then and having like access to that expertise and, and those contacts that is just like invaluable and i'll say one of the biggest um one of the biggest issues with like with an early tech scene like we have in south africa right now like i think it's so cool where you know the, the cape town stuff in tech scene but one of the biggest shortfalls because it's such a young tech scene there isn't a lot there isn't a big brain trust and there isn't a lot of experience so like finding mentors is quite tough um and there are like a lot of business mentors not necessarily like tech mentors and so i mean like to find some really cool people who've helped me out along the way um but yeah, I mean, having the right investors is, is so key, especially when it comes to situations like this. I mean, the market has changed for everyone. Like this is like a new world order in a way. And companies had to pivot really quickly. Like you had, to, I don't know a single company that hasn't like changed to some degree, you know, like this, you have to make some small changes fast enough. Um, and it's been some, some tough calls for a lot of companies. And you have to have investors that back you up, that can help you out, that have your back and, and, and second your decisions. And I think this is when, you know, this is when your relationships are tested. This is when your partnerships are tested. This is when your, your best relationships are tested, when your, um, your team relationships are tested. And yeah, and I think what the last couple of weeks have shown us is that we really got super lucky, you know, with our investors. And I got so lucky with my, my team, my partners. It's awesome. Wow. So I really talk just, a lot, hey? <laughs> No, no, no. Please, that's awesome. Um, just uh, for, for everybody, I mean, you know, and I think funding is always one of those things that, that always is the restriction to people um, actually getting started. They feel like I don't have enough money. I need to get started. Uh, I need to go out and find funding. So two things, and, and there's a question from Wendy here. How did you initially, uh, I'm going to go with initially, how did you initially fund your operation? Um, how did you get started? Um, so when Dixie first started, I mean, it literally was like a little, it wasn't a company, it was like a, it was like a, website that i built for fun almost you know, as a side project and so i did that basically for free um i was at uct i did computer science so i knew enough about how to build a very basic website and i used online tools like wordpress and wix and like and i knew about html so like i kind of hack it together um and then i got like a shared a shared server on hetzner i think it's called zanita now uh, but it was like i think it was like 20 rand a month or something like that um, for like a shared server, so it was very basic. I used to just FTP the code up, um, it was super chilled. And so that kind of started as free. And then when things started getting like bigger and my partners joined, um, we knew we kind of needed like a better operation, we needed better code. Obviously Brendan is a much, he's like a fantastic engineer and developer. So he kind of rebuilt everything properly and we didn't need that proper service then. Um, and once we do more marketing, so one of the first things we did is we used to put like stickers around like UCT campus. And of course that cost money so what we did is um, we would each kind of put money in ourselves. So I know like Brendan, he moved back home with his parents. So then like the rent money he had put in, he'll put to Disconnect. Um, and then Greg had like had another company he had worked on before, uh, which did logistics. So he had some money from there he put in. And then what I did is I had a bachelor apartment and I put a drywall up down the middle and I rented half of that on Disconnect. Um, and I used that money to actually pay to Disconnect. Uh, it wasn't a lot, you know, it was like, a couple hundred rand here or there, or like a couple thousand rand here and there. Um, for example, like when we did our first big market campaign was when we did the 10,000 rand DCT. It took us a long time to save that money up, literally like almost rand by rand. That like 10,000 rand was like precious to us. Um, so yeah, we just kind of started really, really slow, which I'm glad because I think you have to understand the value of money. Like that 10,000 rand was like a lot of money. We like bled for that. It took us a long time to save that up. Um, and so like we didn't just we don't ever just spend like you know willy nilly. So when we raised the twelve million rand, um, we made sure to like tranche it in a way that kind of like made that we would understand the value of that. So every rand still had value for us, and it wasn't just like reckless spending, which I think can happen if you raise too much money with like too little experience, or you kind of don't understand the value of money. I think you have to relate every rand back to what it costs you to get that rand. So like you know like working for your money shows it cost me like x many hours of my life sitting at my desk sweating over this computer of like thinking about waking up about day in and day out working through the uncertainty or, or like the stress whatever it is like this is what this money cost me so when i spend it i better get bang for my buck i better get my value for it that's awesome and then um uh what i was going to ask you on uh, you know you, you get into the the funding and let's go back to funding uh you, you your outlook with them is, is it a medium-term investment is it a, a long-term investment are they with you for the, the long haul? So it's not a loan, it's, it's actually full-on equity investment with them. Yeah, absolutely. They are partners with us. 
uh, come what may, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health. <laughs> okay. awesome. They are riding um, us. And where did that come from? Did, was that through your network? Was that through uh, innovation hubs, uh, um, networking events? Or what, where, where did you find this class? What we actually did want to raise money is that um, my, neither myself or my business partners knew too much about finance. Um, like I studied, I was studying biology and philosophy at UCT. <laughs> so I knew squat about business or finance or any of this kind of stuff. Um, I've had to do online courses, learn as I go, speak to people, read as many books as I possibly can. Luckily, there's like a plethora of startup books out there, some really good ones. Um, but just, yeah, I mean, I had to learn as much as I could. And, and so I knew we needed someone who was better equipped with finance um, than we were. So we actually approached uh, Greg's older brother, uh, knew someone who was an auditor at Deloitte in London, South African guy, but he'd been working there. Um, and a CA, um, obviously very experienced with finance. And he'd done this for a while now. So he would actually like work with companies and then run their fundraising for them. So, I mean, fundraising is, it's become quite structured now. There's like, you get seed round, series A, series B, series B1, B2, whatever it is. And like, there's all these like rules around it, but it really is actually like whatever you want it to be. Um, you can do it however you want. You can, there's, there's no set rules on how to raise money for your company. Um, but you kind of have to know the rules before you can break them. You know, we don't know anything. So we bought this, his name was Simon and we bought him on board and he came on South Africa and he spent a few months with our company, like three months understanding exactly the business model, where we're going, what our vision was. And he kind of put the whole thing together. So the pitch deck, he did the financials, he did the projections, um, he did our budgets, even though at the time our budget was like hundred rand for marketing, you know, <laughs> so we had to go from like a hundred rand for marketing to like 500,000 rand, um, which is, I was like mind blowing for us. So just thinking about how we would actually measure the ROI on that, you know, and then using different tools to see where that will all go to. And so he joined us for a while and he put together the pitch deck and put together the budget. And then um, we started reaching out to, I think we even started like Googling people, like literally just like VCs in South Africa or Cape Town. And we would do what we did when we started the company, we would knock on doors, we'd chat to people. Um, and you kind of start getting your name out there. I mean, the VC market is tiny in South Africa. Like everyone knows everyone. Um, like, yeah, if someone like, for example, like a VC reached out to us recently and then I was trying to our investors about that. And they're like, oh, of course we know them. And like everyone, like, yeah, everyone knows everyone. So once we chat to a few people, send a pitch deck out there, um, then you kind of just wait for someone to like, who's interested. And then we got some guys calling us and we'll go pitch them in person. You kind of like have those like first chats. Um, yeah, and then you kind of like, you, you see where the fit is. You know, you see if you guys have the right vision for the company, if, if, uh, if what your work you're doing falls in their portfolio, um, if they believe you're the team to bring this to life. You know, so much of fundraising isn't, I mean, obviously it's the idea in the business, but the founders are like 50% of the reason why they either bite or they don't bite. Um, if they believe that you're the wrong team to, to make this company work. I mean, I've heard of so many startups that are brilliant ideas, um, but the, the VCs didn't believe the founders were the ones to kind of make it come to life. So yeah, and then you find the right fit. And then after that, then you go into term sheets. Um, we discuss kind of the high level details of it. And then you go into legals. Um, and then you get a paycheck and then you have to, and then the real hard way we have to prove that all these promises came true. <laughs> you promised these amazing numbers. You didn't have to make sure that actually happens. That's awesome. And I mean, it's clear, it's clear. I mean, you know, to achieve things. So, I mean, you found a, you found a problem when you're sitting in the SLC, you, you've got this portfolio to take care of day students. Um, you see a problem, you take a step to try and uh, fix it or alleviate it. In the talk you said with heavy shit was that you were late, too lazy to do certain things. So you decided to put a website in place. So okay, you know, necessity. Um, and then, and then you get to space where now you get to say you built a business and you need funding, and you guys again take action. You contact people, you you speaking to people, and you're getting yourself out there, and you're putting mm. yourself out there, which I think a lot of people are too scared to do is to mm. first are too scared to fail, um, and too scared to be almost um, embarrassed. Maybe, maybe it's an ego or pride thing, or just maybe not. Um, uh, um, putting belief in themselves ultimately. Mm -hmm. And I put a quote and I invite out to everybody I said, um, and I took it from your Twitter feed, which was, if you can't stop your fear, then, then do it scared. And I think it's, it's, it's a brilliant quote that people need, need to really take to heart is if, you, if you're scared, if you're scared or you've got fear, just do it anyway. And what's the difference? I think um, it's actually the best indicator that you're going the right way. I think that like, if you're comfortable, it means you're stagnant and it means you're just like, just like, you're like an enemy you're just like sitting on the rock you know like not really doing much <laughs> i think that 
fear means doing the right thing. I mean, fear means you're growing. Fears mean that you actually like you're actually being brave. Like no one's brave when they're not scared. You just kind of again you're that an enemy. But like when you're actually scared and you're doing it, um, that shows growth. That that means everything. That's what like that is what your your life story is about. It's when you were scared and you did something. That's when like that's what counts more than anything I think in your life is doing things when you're scared. And I think the other point about um, being you know what what might drive fear is this, this idea that like your work isn't good enough or that you'll be ridiculed for it. And the thing I realized the other day is that like, no one really cares too much about what you do. Like either you do something brilliant and then everyone cares it's brilliant or you do something mediocre and then no one really cares. I mean, no one thinks about you but you think about yourself. Like, everyone's thinking about themselves. Everyone's thinking about their own lives. No one is thinking about you that much. So like this whole idea of like, oh, I'm gonna try to do something and everyone's gonna like judge me. No one's gonna judge you. No one's gonna care. So like either do something extraordinary, in which case everyone will be like, wow, that's incredible. Or like you do it and it's not extraordinary, but then like it'll be forgotten about. Like there's so much content you pushed out to the world right now that like, I think no one has time to really like judge bad work. They'll just move on to it. And by putting it out there, what you might do is you'll get feedback there. People be like, oh, I didn't like this idea or this thing because of X, Y, and Z. And you're like, oh, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize that. That's such good feedback. You go back and fix it, you iterate and put it out there again. And maybe it's really good. So you just have to keep like throwing things up against the wall and seeing what sticks. But I think the idea to stop because you worry about ridicule. Um, yeah, I mean, like, no one, it's, it's like, it's a made up perception that people ridicule you. Like, no one actually really cares enough, I think, to ridicule anyone else because they worry about their, themselves. And there's another point I was going to make about, I can't remember what it was now. Um, oh, it's gone. Maybe I'll remember it later. That's okay. <laughs> but I think, I think it was also relevant. Um, again, another quote from, again, I'm, I'm quoting you quite a bit, but yeah, and being willing to fail. And there was something you said in, in the well, shift um, chat again, being willing to fail and get out there. Um, yes, and Megan's last question, yeah, is um, sort of the extension that what's your biggest professional failure and how did you get past it? Oops, sorry, I just had to mute because my Slack was going back. Can you just repeat that question? <laughs> no, no, I was just saying, um, uh, Megan asked her uh, off the back of being willing to fail, so we'll chat about that. Then. Um, Megan asked, what's your biggest uh, professional failure and how did you get past that? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I'm no stranger to failure. Like, I did terribly at school every single year. I mean, I, I failed a lot of grades at school, literally just like flat out failed. Um, I just didn't care. I had such a bad attitude. I hated, I hate authority. I hate being told what to do. I hated sitting in little rows, being told where to speak, where to be quiet, like what kind of stuff to write. Like, I remember one time the teacher was like, write an essay on, I don't know, like trees. And I was like, I don't like trees. I want to write an essay on sharks. And so I was like, sent to detention or whatever. And so, I was just an absolute menace. So I was kind of used to the idea from a very early age that like, I was failing. And, and also like teachers, it's interesting, teachers didn't really hold back on, on like on casting their judgments on like who was, who was good and who was bad. So I was told pretty much like throughout my entire schooling career that like I was a problem child and because I was always in attention. I mean, I scrubbed desks and I was writing lines and I was weeding gardens. And I think it just, it bred this defiance in me. And the more they tried to kind of like put me in line, the more I just like, kept lashing back um, until eventually did the smartest thing they've ever done and they made me a prefect, which made me, <laughs> which turned my leaders overnight <laughs> and I became the most law-abiding citizen, <laughs> which was a brilliant move on their part. <laughs> and I went from being in detention to running detention. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the best thing about <laughs> that failure taught me was that, you know, every single year at school was just that like, you don't deserve anything like you don't the world doesn't owe you anything like i i hated the system of school i felt like the i felt like the global political systems were corrupt and, and inefficient and ridiculous um i felt like there's much injustice i couldn't do enough about that i didn't like i just there was so much in the world that i didn't like and my way of dealing with it was to just like say well you know like, screw the system i'm not going to be a part of this i'm going to step out i'm going to break it down i'm going to throw rocks i'm going to like not learn anything um and I sit with my arms crossed and I kind of like frowning and being like, this is all rubbish. And I realized then that like, that's not how you kind of get anything done. And my repeated failure told me that like, no one's going to give you a leg up. No one's going to like help you out and the world doesn't owe you anything. And you have to do it yourself. Like you have to actually like sit down and like kind of earn your right at the table. Um, and I think failure kind of like saying that, you know, it bred this defiance in me, this defiance to like, to be better, to level up, to kind of like make myself 
worthy of implementing change. If I didn't like the world, then like I could change it. But like being cross at everyone else for it wasn't going to do anything. I remember I tried to have this protest once, save Darfur at like my school, and like no one cared. And I was just like, you're all such terrible people for not caring, but like why should they care? You know, I hadn't actually given a convincing enough reason or show like why they should actually care or done anything about it myself other than like had a placard up. I mean, who cares about that? And I was like, talking about change isn't change. You have to actually do it. And what I realized, is, you know, through all that was that like, yeah, like no one was going to give me a leg up. I had to pull myself up. I had to do the work. I had to sit down and make it happen. Like I had to actually just do it and stop talking about it and do it. And for example, like when in grade 11, like I failed most of my subjects. I remember I got like 23% on maths. And I was just like, I can't remember what happened. I remember thinking to myself, I was like, I keep going on about like, I don't like where the world is. I want to change it. I want to make it better. I want to like, improve things. But like, who's going to listen to like someone who failed like school every single year and kind of didn't get anywhere. And what I'm going to go like, you know, bum around the world backpacking and just be right angry blog posts about it. Like, like you had to kind of actually like prove that I was like as able to make those changes. And so I remember like I worked, Sunny Matric came along and I worked so hard um, enough to find that sure like I get to university. Um, so I felt that was the right call, the right, right move at the time, you know, to kind of and then get an education so I could, I could make my voice heard and I could stop everything change and actually like build projects and, and start things like getting into SRC or like running initiatives or, or, you know, like joining conversations or like getting the ball rolling myself. And that's what told me every time is that like, like if you fail that like it sucks it really does but like it's not an excuse to stop trying you know and it's quite like it's like a hard ass approach but like this is <laughs> this is a phrase that Greg and I often say to each other when we're starting too whiny but like eat a spoon of cement and harden the fuck up like you've got to just do it you know like oh boo hoo mm-hmm. like I failed to check oh boo hoo like this bad thing happened to me like eventually you have to take yourself seriously and, and take responsibility for yourself and like radical self-responsibility I mean, if you don't like things, change it. And that's what, you know, failure taught me again and again. It's just that, like, you know, this defiance to keep trying, this defiance to say, like, you know, every time you get kicked in the face, I'm going to do it again just to kind of, like, just because I can, because I have to, because no one else is going to do it for me. Um, yeah. That's quite a, quite a hectic response. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. Um, we, we've got on, on Thursday, we've got um, Nick Harry or, or, or the uh, Nick from Nick Harry, and um, I'll again want to talk from him. And he was he was saying um, there's nothing to fear except death. Otherwise, the fear doesn't really matter. Um, and I think it's also quite a sort of relevant for this part is is you know just doing things and taking taking control. Like I say, so this fear of failure. Of, I mean, failure is not really failure, is it? Until, unless it kills you, because um, then, then you're you're no longer worth it. So. Um, <laughs> So, so let's go back to the business quickly and, and sort of chat about, you started with this um, spreadsheet uh, matching uh, owners and, and uh, students that wanted accommodation and then you moved into the space now and you said it earlier on, you're now the biggest portal in Africa uh, providing student accommodation, which is quite a, quite a feat and I'm sure you've got global ambitions as well. I'm sure there's some big, big plans there. I mean, there's four more students um, all over the world that you can sort of take advantage, not uh, sort of the market that you can take advantage of. Um, but you, 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 and you, you spoke about um, uh, uh, it being a global problem firstly, but then also looking at creating a community. Um, you've spoken about um, enabling students beyond their student life to be able to come into uh, a space where the financial sector takes them seriously. Mm-hmm. And then the last one was um, you've also become a bit of a data business. We'll get into the reports because there's a few questions around uh, the student market and you guys have now produced a a report around the student market to give people insights and politicians insights into the market. So it's not just a it's not just a matching service anymore. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know, starting talking about going global, I think that absolutely, I mean the world is full of students and people with like ambitions for like higher education. But I think what really appeals to us is, you know, like obviously this has become a business and we're, like, we're entrepreneurs and so like the, there's the business side to consider but I think what really excites us is the idea of like affecting change and I think that while a lot of people kind of like you know we look to markets like the US um, I find the idea of kind of like these like the more like emerging markets to be like so exciting you know there's like so much potential and there's, there's such a need and like you know even a small amount of like of infrastructure can affect so much change and on such a huge scale. Like I think going to places where like there's this emerging consumer market in you know across Africa, especially East Africa right now, super exciting. Um, you know, India, South America, like parts of Asia. I mean, Asia is just like 
it is massive. It's mind blowingly massive. Like the amount of people there and the amount of capital that's, that's kind of coming, you know, consumer capital is coming out there is just like huge right now. And I think that like having your eye on Asia as an entrepreneur is just like, yeah, I mean, reading it, it's just, there's so much potential there. And Africa also, I mean, our growth population here, it's a young population. The mobile coverage here means that like a lot more people have access to e-commerce. So in terms of like selling, selling products and services, there's just a lot of people. Um, and obviously it's, it's like, it's an unstable market. So you have to have, you know, kind of like iron in your guts to be able to kind of like deal with like political instability to deal with um, a new way of doing things, you know, kind of uncharted territory. But I think that you know, there's people with money and they want to spend it on things. Um, that's the story so with happening with China and South Korea. I think that there's a lot of potential happening there. Um, so we're really excited about that and something that we're looking into. Um, okay. Yeah, and then about like the other services. I mean, it's a bit of it's a bit of both. On the one hand, I think that you know, obviously, there's so much potential. In everything, as every entrepreneur will have their eye on like a million prize at once. You know, you'll see, you look around and you'll see, I think Richard Branson said opportunity like there's, there's London buses, you know, there's red bus that come around every two minutes. You know, there's, there's opportunity, there's ideas, there's talented people everywhere. Um, and I get a lot of calls, people saying, hey, we want to do this, what do you think? Or let's get involved there. Um, and a lot of the ideas are really exciting. I think a lot of them have legs. Um, but on the one hand, on the other hand, I also say that I think, I think there's a lot of value in staying like laser focused like hyper hyper focused and being like what is your problem what is your solution like, what is your kpi you're trying to solve and until you completely wax that and own that and you're the expert at getting that right i think it's i don't i don't know if it's the best thing to kind of like to just to stray from that a lot of people have done multiple businesses being very successful at that at any one time perhaps after experience but i've become quite an advocate of like laser focus i think it's because i was quite unfocused before and i saw it didn't work out you know to the best advantage of the company so now kind of picking one thing and doing that really well and absolutely like being the best at that. Because if you're not being the best at that, someone else will come and like compete with you and then they'll, you know, they'll start competing and then they'll get your market and then you have to go back to that and defend that. So kind of like own your, own your foundation completely, I think, and then start like looking at other things. But if you, I think if you start exploring other avenues too soon, um, you kind of aren't putting that faith in like in your core and your foundation. So Absolutely, you want to like absolutely looking at their ideas right now. It's super exciting, but getting our foundation right is paramount important. Of paramount importance. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so, so you said you said something there is, is identifying the problem and, and dealing with the problem and coming up with the solution. And you said it earlier when we were talking, you know, you identified a problem um, and sort of came up with the solution. You, you mentioned now again, and um, it, again in, in the previous talk you had mentioned every time you sat with a. A, a principal or chancellor or, or academic institution. Your question to your to your customer was, "Well, you know, what's your problem?" I think one of the one of the issues with entrepreneurs is is like I say, there's lots of ideas out there. If you have them yourself, you come across the opportunities. But sometimes the opportunity really or the idea isn't really feasible because there's no uh, consumer. So you seem to have found the the opposite. I mean, you you started something uh, and you bootstrapped it. Like you're saying earlier, you really sort of went in low level. Um, make sure you didn't invest all your time, money, and, and uh, all, all, all your money in it, at least that, that would, would break you. And you built this business off the back of, of real demand. I mean, what's your advice to people who have got ideas that they want to get out and really take advantage of a market that they see? Um, so I think, I think like it's always a good idea. Like, so Ernest Hemingway always said, write what you know. Like write a book if you know a lot about it because you can like make it convincing. And I think maybe the same thing applies. I think it was Ernest Hemingway who said that. I hope so because now someone might Google it and be like, you're completely wrong. <laughs> but I think the same thing, if it was Ernest Hemingway, if I think the same thing kind of applies to business in a way. I think that if you build a business about things you know really well, um, you kind of just like, or it's something you're really passionate about, something you like, like you kind of experienced yourself. I think it kind of gives you a leg up in a way. Like, you know, if, if it's something you're, like you're dealing with every single day. It's an issue, it's a problem that you're dealing with. And it really is like grinding your gears and you would pay someone else to fix that for you. Um, then that's, I don't know, a good sign, you know? And if you know people that are facing the same issue and you'll pay them to fix that issue for you, or you're currently, like there's an issue and there's someone solving it, but they solve it really badly and it's really expensive and you kind of just don't like them either because they're kind of just like maybe it's a bad company or they're just useless, whatever. Like that's a good indicator. And if you know enough people, that's kind of a good enough reason to start with an MVP. 
And I think that MVP is super important. So like you want to launch as soon as possible. I mean, I know, again, so many entrepreneurs who've come to me and they had these super cool ideas, um, but they haven't done anything about it. You know, they haven't like put like, you know, marked up a basic website or put together a basic prototype or like even sketched it out or even drawn out like a plan or drawn out and like some, some consumer survey or chatted to people about it. They kind of just like thought about it. And I was like, well, how long have you been thinking about this? They're like, yeah, about five years. I'm like, no, like do something about it now. Like write this very, like you can do even the smallest thing you can do. You can speak to someone about it or like consumers about it. You can put, you can build a, a website for free on Wix.com. You can, you know, and so once you kind of have that, like, you know, the idea together, I think then it obviously depends on what's, what the nature of, of your business is. But I mean, one good idea is, you know, you build like a website for it, like a really basic, even like a Wix one for free or like a, a WordPress one or something very basic. Um, you don't put any money in, you know, and like make it about your topic and then put Google Analytics on that website and see how many hits you get. So let's say, for example, you think you're going to start selling binoculars and you like, there's definitely a market for like bespoke binoculars, like with your name engraved on the side or something like that. And then you create like a, a free website on Wix for like these bespoke binoculars and you maybe use for like five or five, six, seven or 10 project ideas. And you kind of see maybe like a website gets a lot of traffic, you know, or if there's like conversations online about it. Um, then yeah, I don't you kind of see the traffic or the interest like there, but I mean, I, I've never built a company outside of something I wasn't directly experiencing myself. Like I was doing something I was dealing with, my friends dealing with it. And then when I was in the SRC, I saw that the entire university was dealing with this. I mean, I had no idea what the actual data now. And when I started, first of all, but I knew that like I had enough people queuing outside my door, that was an issue. And then, you know, when I spoke to other SRCs, they had the same issue there. Um, and then when we started doing some proper research now, like we saw this report, which we're issuing now in the next few days, that it is just like, it's a huge issue. Like, hundreds of thousands of students you know don't can't find student accommodation and like an intuition ended up panning out correctly and often there is data out there but also timing is everything hey like there are so many there's so many business ideas that like are brilliant but just the wrong timing and then things happen and they just kind of come alive i mean look how this coronavirus it just changed the destiny of companies like we don't change the destiny but like you know with, with zoom or, or with slack um something that would have taken them maybe five years to get to happen within a space of a few weeks. So, you know, the way the market shifts or demand shifts or some it's very quick and some it's quite slow. Um, but I'd say a good indicator is always like, if it's an issue that you're facing and that like you would pay someone to fix, um, it's a good place to start because probably chances are someone else also paid to get fixed. That's awesome. So um, just so we had a quick correction and I hate to do this to you, but it wasn't in an understanding way, it was uh, Mark Twain. But uh, uh, good, good, good quote either way. So, uh, but thanks for that, Tamron. Uh, so, so let's. Um, there's two things. So, um, uh, I, I really want to talk about your your sort of guerrilla marketing. And there's two two things you did. I think it was last year, um, which was uh, throwing cash in in a um, throwing cash at students, which is always <laughs> a great marketing stunt. And then part two is um, having T Rexes running up and down again at UCT um, T Rex run. So, so I want to sort of speak about those because I think it's important uh, not only when you come up with a product, you've got this website, you've got you started out and everything else, but you know your idea might be brilliant and you might be see that visual demand, but you've got to get it to market somehow. People need to know about it, and even the best ideas have died because they haven't been able to get it to market. So, I mean, yeah. So let's let's talk about those and the idea behind trying cash at students. I mean, it's almost obvious when you do it. Um, you know, students always need money. So that's a sort of obvious one. And then having um, T-Rex is running up and down. And do you have any other sort of things like that, then? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's the one point on things seeing obvious in retrospect. I mean, it's crazy how like, like we had just even the other day, we were trying to work on this um, new feature at the moment. And it's quite an important feature for our website in the next like few months. And we had like a solution for it. The feature was brilliant. And then I was chatting to one of our, our clients like the other on the phone about just about like how he's dealing with the whole the whole situation and talking about this new feature we're gonna unroll. And I was like, What do you think of this new feature? And he's like, That sounds really complicated. Why don't you just do it like this other way? And I was just like, Oh my gosh, like it is he provided a solution that was so obvious and like we had all missed it for three months. And I was like, It is so obvious. And I was like, How could it be so stupid? Like, you miss things all the time, and that's often why I like having like a pair of like outside eyes like a mentor or like speaking to your users is just like if we don't say it enough like speak to your users like every single day because like they know the issue they're facing they're the ones that are hacking together your product to make it suit their purposes you know and chance if you just make a small fix like i never get the story about like you know airbnb when 
they were, um, they were you know, they're doing Y Combinator, you know, that really famous incubator in, in California. And they, they like, what well, issues they're facing, they weren't getting enough bookings. And so they sent out a photographer to go do professional photographs of like a few properties. Um, and then they'll go through the stats with like Paul Graham. And Paul Graham was like, why is there a huge like number of bookings for these properties, not the other one? And they're like, oh yeah, we sent a photographer out there. And he was like, wait, what? Like, same photographers do all properties. There's like 10 times as many bookings for these properties as the other ones. So like just an outside pair of eyes looking at the exact thing that you're looking at, you'll see something that you're missing. Um, so that is just things like, a, like obviously in retrospect is, yeah, it's always painful when you realize like how you're so blind that someone else spot something, but it's grateful that we spotted that. Um, in terms of marketing, yeah, I mean like Dave's Connect, you know, we're, we're a two-sided marketplace. And so it only really works when you have um, enough buyers and sellers on each side. So like enough sellers being enough landlords and the five being students because landlords are only going to list if there's students there. I mean, you want to fill your property up as a landlord. You want to get good tenants as fast as you can to sign a lease. Like that's, that's your, your value. That's what you want to do. And for a student, you want to find a cool digs that's safe and you know, close to campus with like cool people. Like those are things that, you know, like that's, that's, that's the student's priorities. And we had to kind of like, and if there aren't enough options, like for students, they can't find digs that suit them. There's so many different like, you know, criteria. If it's the wrong price, the wrong area, um, the no, no Wi-Fi, or say they've got more specific requirements, like has to be halal, um, you know, then, then they just, they, they won't find any use in your platform because they can't find what they're looking for. So like the only way to really counteract against that, as opposed to just, you know, we could just go for a very niche, even more niche segment, or just having enough volume. So there's enough options for everyone. So we have to get enough people on there. Um, and so, we like, we have to, marketing was key for us to get, to make this viable, you know, make the brand also trustworthy, people who know they could go on us. I mean, a lot of websites, you just need like, you know, one bad experience where, you know, you have like a dodgy seller or we all know websites like that where you've had a bad experience and you're just like, wow, like I'm not going back there again. Um, so like getting that with us was like super important. Um, and so yeah, it was like the very early days before we did the fundraising and we had scraped together 10,000 Rand um, and we knew we had to get like, a lot of money out of this, like a lot of money in terms of like the, the value we get out of this. And so we were thinking about how to spend it. So we had the idea of the stickers. The stickers being very successful. Like, you know, we just go put stickers up around campus because they were funny. They were everywhere, um, like literally everywhere. They didn't wash off easily. Um, and people just seemed to like them. You know, students put them on their laptops because they were cool or like on their car, holding up license discs, whatever it was. So we thought we'd do more stickers, but we're like, oh, we've done that already. And posters are a bit lame. I mean, you can do posters, sure, but like it shouldn't be like the linchpin of your marketing strategy. Um, digital marketing is always a good idea. So like, you know, influencer marketing or, or cool ads. The thing is that like people on their phones see ads nonstop. I mean, if you're scrolling through TikTok, through Instagram, through whatever it is, you're just constantly seeing this content. So like having something really stand out, it has to be brilliant. Um, and especially if it's a name you don't know about. If you scroll past, I don't know, like, I'm under binoculars for some reason, like binocular company, and you never heard them before, you'd be like, whatever, like scroll right past it. I mean, maybe you really want to buy binoculars, but still, you probably, the ad will really mean that much to you unless you know about the brand name. I mean, you might stop for a Nike ad because you're like, wow, Nike is cool and like it's good quality, but like you won't stop for like a random one. So it's like, how do we really get our name out there? And we're thinking about like what things stuck at university is like, kind of like talking points or like scandal. Like if everyone's going home to their digs that evening and being like, oh my gosh, you won't believe what happened today. Like this like, and there's always sort of fly through campus because campuses are quite like insular. Everyone kind of knows everyone across faculties. You've got friends who are in health science, even though you're in engineering, whatever it is. Or you've got like digs mates that are doing, you know, film or whatever it is. So like everyone kind of knows everyone. Um, and I, I think it's great came with the idea. We're kind of sitting like in our old, old office, which is like a little tiny room, someone else's office that we were using. And there were three of us sharing one desk <laughs> and we were sitting in there and we're like, what should we do? And then I think Greg was like, let's just throw it out on campus. Instead of like spending the money, let's just like throw it out. And we we're like, that is insane. Like, that's a crazy idea. Let's do it. And we were terrified the whole time. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, even thinking about it now, I just, my stomach is like getting butterflies. It was, it was, it was crazy. I mean, it's absolutely crazy because like we had done a, quite a big build up going to the actual event. Um, we had like gotten some of like, the, the best like campus influencers who we knew had like, a lot of like followers on Instagram. Um, if you were like live tweeting about it and like doing little hints of where it's going to happen. And we had done like these little mini jobs beforehand. And um, we also made sure that we didn't want to get anyone to get actually hurt. So we got like security there 
Um, we had like paramedics there. So it was like, we knew it kind of like, if anything got really bad, it would be like fine. Um, Cause yeah, it was supposed to be like a fun event. Um, and then we had like photographers there also. And we completely underestimated how popular it was going to be. Cause we thought we could maybe like handle a crowd of like a hundred people, or something like that. But there were thousands, like thousands of people. It was just, like most people, they just spectate. Like it was just like this, like events, almost like you know, like this. Yeah, it's like you know, this like jammy Thursdays. Every Thursday thing happens on, on campus, and people would go like, watch just kind of literally like one of those events where like everyone was just there, and it was just super fun. I mean, like the the response was like really positive. Like everyone, of course, was like tweeting about it, or they were on Instagram live streaming, and everyone's like, oh my gosh, I just got a hundred rand on campus, and people were like, we're going in coffees, or we're buying cigarettes. Back in the days, we could buy cigarettes. And they were, yeah, it was just like a really, it was like a, something that happened on campus that everyone had like a lot of fun. Everyone was talking about it. Everyone's like, oh my gosh, another day, you know, at, at university, these things were happening all the time. <laughs> and it just kind of spread around. I mean, people talking about it um, on social media and like, you know, like the whole of UCT knew about Digs Connect then, you know, in the next few days. And it's like, these guys are crazy, and especially because we were really students up until really recently. Um, it was kind of like, we were part of the community. We're like outsiders going there, you know? um so yeah i mean it was <laughs> it was a hell of an event <laughs> um it was super exciting and then the t-rexes happened when we realized that having actual on-campus uh marketing was was a really good way to market i think like again i have not got a marketing background i've studied marketing i don't know all the theory behind it but i feel like everyone's kind of being like digital is everything and you have to market digitally and i'm sure there's maybe like that supports that but we just found that like we got a lot of traffic and a lot of signups, we would actually be on campus with students, like actually being there with them um, and not kind of in this like tech ivory tower kind of thing. So um, we would go onto campus and like chat to students and just like be there with them. And the TH races kind of came out of that where we got this, I think when they were like, the three of us were at this like Chinese warehouse looking at like gifts to do giveaways because we love doing like giveaways to students. And then I saw this T-Rex outfit and I was like, oh my gosh, look how ridiculous this thing is. And we got it as a joke just for like the office. And we're going to wear this T-Rex outfit in the office just to kind of like fool around because we're just ridiculous. So like run around the office and like punch each other in like these T-Rex outfits. Um, and then I think one day like someone's like running laps around the parking lot in this T-Rex outfit. And we were just like, that is so, like, that's stupid and hilarious. And then Greg was like, imagine we had people racing across campus like imagine like the whole UCT just like these dinosaurs running across campus like and it's just the most ridiculous thing and we're like okay let's do it that's brilliant so we did it bits as well actually we did it bits and UCT and we just had students that would race um for like a prize and it's like it's like, you see the videos and like the photos it is so funny because like you know they got these little t-rex arms and they're like flapping wildly in the world <laughs> as these guys are running and again like people had so much fun like there was a huge crowd Everyone came to watch it. Um, it just, it's cool. Like the marketing we did, like it built, like the, it was so true of our brand. Like people knew this was a Digs Connect event. It was fun. It was lighthearted. Um, it was on campus. Uh, it just was like true to our brand. It was an authentic. It was we were authentically we were having fun as a company. And I think that that just like that really spoke to students when they are like, it's like this level of trust. You know, we're on campus with you. We're also wearing the T-Rex outfits. Um, it's something you can't replace. It isn't like this like big corporate, like sitting in like in a glass tower somewhere, like looking at like the financial, what's the bottom line here. It's like, we're students just like you. We're on campus solving a problem that we face, that you're facing. Um, and we're wearing T-Rex outfits. And for students, they thought that was so cool. And it kind of got us this place. And like, I think in, in the hearts of students that perhaps like, yeah, I think that other companies that perhaps like don't have that, like they aren't that in touch with the markets, you know, don't have. So, so, I mean, it, it's obviously clear that it's important to try and get to your customer or get to your clients. I mean, that's something that, that when you get into market, you need to know exactly who that client is. It's, it's, I suppose, a little bit easier in the student space, so that's who you focus on. But uh, no matter what, what business you're in, you need to get the message to your client and you guys have a, a really good and fun way. And there are videos uh, online that you guys can see um, some of those things. So let's get to the report and, and we've got a few questions around um, the student markets. I'm going to ask the question, but then sort of just link it to your report and, and, and the data that you've created. I mean, obviously, with so many beds um, and, and landlords and, and tenants on your or using your platform, you're getting very interesting data looking yeah. forward. And, and um, so, so the question here from Shabir is um, with the new regulation on uh, NASAS, 
um, have you found that you, your risk of rent payments has not been paid, has increased? So, I mean, obviously it's not your rent, but it's your landlords. Um, has the risk increased because of the new regulations around it? Um, so, there's a lot going on in this list. Um, and there's been a few changes to try and figure out, you know, there's been a lot of problems, um, well documented problems and challenges they faced over the last couple of years. Um, and they tried a few different ways to kind of overcome that. You know, there's, I think this was used to try, in some, in some instances, they'll give the students these cards and they would load money onto those cards and the students would pay like that. Um, in other in instances, and this was to try to pay the landlords directly and they would have landlords fill in forms and then submit those, um, like proving they were landlords and students were staying there and there were lease agreements. But of course, I mean, there's 800,000 students getting this funding. So the system, I think also, I don't know how digital it was. So I think that was, that was the challenging. And then they also, I think now the latest is to pay out the universities and then the universities manage the relationship and then they will then pay out um, the landlords. And then there's issues around still giving the students, you know, cards to pay them on cash directly because then maybe the, the money could move faster because there's issues of money being delayed. But of course, if it's cash, there's, there's a bigger issue of landlords not being paid or, or you know, instances of fraud that we've been hearing about or corruption. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of challenges. I mean, just actually just, I mean, quite recently in February, um, Parliament, there's a, there's a working group or committee um, on higher education and MET. Um, and I can send you a link to it, also in the link here, but basically they, they spoke about the challenges that are being faced specifically in the housing sector. And uh, the, the conclusion they reached, the, the government reached three points, is that first of all, there's just, there's not enough beds on campus. I mean, this is like, this is a well-documented like fact that there's aren't enough beds on campus. Um, the second point is that students obviously now like have to find beds off campus, um, but there's no way to really regulate the standards of that. So like, you know, students are, they have to find through, you know, and the, you think it obviously is one method, but you know, in case we're not active, they have to look at posts or halls and find a place, but they're not being regulated. And this was, does have these norms and standards, um, but they're not, they're not really upheld by the universities because they're very stringent on things that don't necessarily make that much sense. For example, like one of the requirements is that the property has to have a, an area of land roughly the size of a volleyball court. And like where in an urban center will you find a patch of land the size of a volleyball court? And this means that like, you know, tens of thousands of landlords that have adequate property, like really good property to houses for students are now being excluded from these standards for like arbitrary reasons. I mean, still enforcing things like, you know, saying like, let's look at, talk about things that are actually important, like safety standards or talk about things like um, internet access or kind of like um, the viability to have like a, to be an academically inducive environment. Um, so there's kind of like those, the standards are outdated and they're not being implemented. Um, and finally, then the government in this, in this meeting, they thought, okay, cool, let's maybe look at building student accommodation. But it is just obviously like extremely expensive uh, to build student accommodation on these student villages on, on, a, on a large scale, big enough scale to fix this issue. Um, and as we all know right now, there is like government will not have the money to build student accommodation. I mean, like the budget is just like, it's been decimated by Corona and our response to that um, and trying to like, you know, save the central parts of the economy. So those are the three issues that government was facing. Um, there's not a bed on campus. They couldn't find a way to regulate these beds and it's just too expensive to build new beds. So what we came with Dix Connect as our solution to this um, is that we built this technology called the Virtual Res. And what the Virtual Res does basically is it's a super cool tool and it's for the college and universities. We actually have two colleges that are busy using it right now piloting it. And landlords around the university or college, when they're creating a listing on Dix Connect, they can send an application to their local college or university saying, um, so this is my property. You can see the pictures. You can see that it's, um, you know, it's, it's fantastic. It's got security features, it's got Wi-Fi, it's got whatever the university stipulates the requirements are. Um, we, we, we suggest what we think new requirements should be. Um, but of course, that's a conversation that everyone has to buy into. You know, the universities, the landlords, the students, and this was government have to buy into those. We think it should be a lot less stringent. I mean, you don't need obviously a volleyball-sized area of land. That's that's ridiculous. Um, but things that are important, of course, are things like safety and and like Wi-Fi or whatever it is. Um, but then the landlord can apply to the virtual res to their, their local college or university. The university then has a dashboard on Digs Connect, which you can see then all the different like landlords have applied. And they can then go, we then built out a decentralized system of students. There's two students at each university um, and they get requests, kind of like how Uber driver get requests on their phone on the Digs app. And it says, um, this landlord has requested verification. Then they get sent out there, they go to see it. They take pictures on their phones, so it all logs it so you can see that the, the listing matches the reality. 
um, and they get grants for the replication like that. So it's instant. And the whole thing completely digitalized, it's like that. So you have up to date, up to the second information basically on, on these properties, if they're verified or not. So now this is students who, who've been granted the NISA's funding can now go on Digs Connect and they can filter for that saying, show me the NISA's properties. And they can see straight away the properties have been verified by the university to where standards it is. And the cool thing now also for government, they can also see that. They can see, okay, cool, actually now there's a shortage of, you know, all these hundreds of thousands of beds. And instead of having to allocate this money, these like billions of rands to building this, let's use the private sector. You know, the beds are already there. And what I find even more exciting about this is that if government was to build property, I mean, the tender would go to like, like a company or maybe one or two companies, whatever. And then all that money would then go to those guys, you know, and the students would all then spend their rent there. So I mean, it's only like a few people that really benefited from this. By using like normal South African homeowners, by using like, you know, all these landlords, there are so many more people that are benefiting. Tens of thousands of landlords now are benefiting from the system. We're like, they're supplying the beds. And it's like this small scale digs type environment, so I think, which really fosters a sense of community with the students living there. Like you get to know each other, like living next door, you'll like the student experience of like, you know, making coffee with each other at two o'clock in the morning because you're both cramming for your test that's happening, you know, at, at 8 a.m. and you're like, oh my gosh. Um, and then anyone suddenly benefits, you know, and then you have these flows of money moving to these communities that are close to universities. And that's what you're trying to accomplish with the virtual res. You say we can save you money. Also, it's instant. You don't have to wait. I mean, building will take like a really long time. You do it right now. You can unlock these beds immediately. The system is decentralized. So like across, you know, across the country, we have these students that can then go out. The students earn money off this is really exciting for them as well. Um, and it's updated instantly. So it's not like right now for a lot of universities, it's actually it's still a paper system. Students have to send through like a paper lease. They also have to send through like a paper lease, like confirming, like posting it. Who still posts things? That's crazy. Like posting is like, <laughs> like paper, you don't have to post paper. Like you can literally do it. You can do it all like online. So that's kind of the, the point of this report that we're releasing. Um, if anyone is watching this interesting getting a copy of the report, you can just like let me know or let Grant know and I can definitely send that through. Um, basically we say is that like the current the current norms and standards as they stand don't make sense and they're not even upheld i don't know a single university which actually upholds them completely because you know we know properties are being verified they don't have volleyball courts or the other things that they ask for um, but are fantastic properties nonetheless they have like they're fantastic for students to live at um and how we can do that how we can go about changing this uh, especially to account the fact that government doesn't have money right now yeah. So the, the report that you put together, is that identifying sort of the hot spots where people should be looking, uh, where there's a real shortage of, of beds, um, you know, what is the, what is, so outside of highlighting um, that they should use private sector, which I think is pretty obvious uh, for everybody except sometimes the government. Um, and <laughs> uh, sort of what are the other sort of highlights or what are the things that, that somebody who's reading the report will get out of it? Um, so we do look into some areas where there's like, we list the universities that got the most and the least amount of funding for housing. Um, so, that, I mean, it's very detailed, it's 85 pages. So there's a, there's a lot going on there. Um, uh, so we do list some areas where there's a need, but not, we don't necessarily go into, it's not, it's not direction towards, um, towards perhaps like landlords that want to look for like, you know, opportunities where to build. We will be working on reports like that. So kind of like where we've noticed um, there's a shortage or we've noticed um, what, what kind of accommodation like sells fast. Like, you know, we've seen if someone puts a listing up and it either like sits in the packet for months and doesn't, you know, go anywhere or someone's listing up and within half an hour, they have like 80 responses, you know, because of certain requirements. Um, and in what areas, what price points, what inclusions, you know, make that kind of what makes property fly um, on the market. So we always start working on those reports. This report is more kind of get like garnered or, or aimed at, at policy. So like, what is the policy around the fiscus of the spending um, towards student housing? So like government has allocated money in the budget towards like, the student housing, if it's going to the universities or it's going to land or it's going to building student accommodation and how we feel that can be better spent using technological tools. I think there's all this talk happening all the time with government, like the fourth industrial revolution or let's embrace tech. But like this sector is like completely un, like there's no tech solutions happening right now. And like we've built this and it's being used, like it, it, it's actually happening right now with some of our, like our pilot colleges. Um, so this is kind of more based on the policy one. I think if you're interested more on the high level, where government money has gone in the past with student housing and where we think it should rather go, in our opinion. That's awesome. So um, Bina asks, is your student market private or nessus? And, and I think sort of you answered that, but, but um, there's a big opportunity for private landlords in the same space that aren't taking advantage of nessus funding for students mm. that can pay privately as, as much as the funded class. Absolutely, there's both. I mean, there's about 2.3 million students in South Africa. Um, and about 800,000 are funded by NISFIS. So it's a bit of both. 
I mean, we definitely deal with both. Um, and then uh, we've got Shabir here. So Shabir's saying, um, as things provide for students in more than upmarket client based like UCT students, you're probably getting rent paid privately, so, so directly by the student parents. Um, this would not be a problem as the most uh, from an affluent background um, or beyond the average. So how does your model fit the less affluent student pool? Mm, well, I mean, yeah, South Africa is interesting like that because they're such a, it's such a diverse country. I mean, we have obviously like very affluent students in South Africa. Um, and then we also have like a lot of like very, very poor students. Um, I mean, and for the poorest students, this just does cover them <laughs> to a certain extent. Um, some of some of the, the allocations are a bit unrealistic, I'd say. I mean, like, like what's, what students are given for rent and what the market actually shows for rent can be like very different numbers, um, which is a bit tricky, I think, then. Um, but generally, when the universities, that's why I think having universities get involved where they're like actually in the context and they know. So like UCT would know what, what average rent prices are around, you know, around their campus, more so than perhaps like, uh, like government is more centralized, you know. Um, and then, of course, then for like one up from NISFIS, it's students that are still like incredibly poor, but don't qualify for NISFIS, NISFIS spending, NISFIS funding. Um, and so it's really tough on them. And I think that, yeah, I think that, that like solutions, creative solutions around housing and um, could kind of like alleviate a lot of problems there. For example, we found that one of the landlords that had approached us um, had, had built this really beautiful student accommodation in Woodstock. But... I built these really big rooms, with like one student per room. Every room was en suite. Um, and it was like high in finishes and it was stunning. But I was like, that isn't the majority of the market. Like most students can't afford that. They don't, also, they don't need that. Like if you look at how most of the residences are built, it's two students per room. It's a sharing room and then it's a bathroom per corridor. So you can really cut costs on that then. So you can make the rent. So the rent makes sense to the landlord. Because obviously the landlord, you have to cover your costs. You know, you've got your mortgage to pay off, your rent and taxes, your security, your a million things to pay off. And so like your rent you charge has to obviously make sense for you. So you're incentivized to keep buying property and investing in, you know, investing in the markets and the economy. Um, and you can do that by like, just being creative with that. I mean, we have these, this one landlord in Joburg who's been super creative with the space. And he's got three students in a room, which also we see residences. But how he's done it is he's created kind of like levels. So some of the beds are like, not necessarily bunk beds, but like, they're like, they, can't, they have like kind of like the bed on top and the desk underneath and the other one has a bed underneath. So there's kind of like levels and then like dividers. So students have visual privacy. So you still kind of have your space. I mean, there's study rooms or silent zones, um, but it's still they cut costs. And so she's going to afford to stay there because the rent's a lot cheaper. So I think kind of just being creative around how you have the students in the room um, and then having like communal bathrooms, so like a bathroom per corridor, um, like kind of like how the residents are built. I mean, when I was at boarding school and high school and we used to or like, she's, I mean, boarding school is a different matter, but there are like a lot of us in the dorm, you know? So most yeah. students, and like if you're young, you're used to sharing with other young people. Okay, awesome. So then um, a combined question from uh, somebody anonymous and then um, uh, Pablo, uh, Pablo um, and then I've got one last question for you to end off, is um, how do you see the market going forward for the rest of the year? Um, how's the market going to evolve? And then um, the third, one of the parts of the question here is, is will online teaching take over? So are you, is it going to be a risk to the student market that online is going to take over? Sure. So that is um, a big question. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a big question. Um, I think before I start, just a disclaimer that like, obviously I, I'm making, I, we've made our assessments as a company based on the information that's available from governments, from the talks that are happening, from trends we're observing. Um, and I definitely don't have any sort of like insider information here that I wish I could, that actually I had, but I could share with everyone being like, it's absolutely gonna be online or it's absolutely gonna be campus-based, whatever it is. I think that no one really has those answers. If they do, I'd love they could share it with me. But from our analysis of where things are going um, with the market, with, with different like, technology being embraced, I think that, I think on the one hand, we've seen that a lot of the ideas we had around why to be physically, you know, in the workplace or why to physically be on campus, a lot of that can actually happen online. And in some cases, it's preferable. And in some cases, it'll be a necessity due to like price. I think that what people can afford, um, people wouldn't have a lot of spare cash, I think, after this. And things that can be, I mean, if you can save money, you will choose to save money. And if studying online is cheaper, I think that, that there could be a force there pushing for that. Um, I think especially in like developed countries, that would be a force. But I've also seen that there's not a lot of internet coverage in, in South Africa, especially in like 
majority of households, which is like, you know, um, like middle class or, you know, all the, all the or the poorer communities, there's not a lot of mobile coverage and especially not high enough bandwidth to allow online learning, like, you know, video learning or the tools you need. Um, yeah, there's definitely, you know, there's, there's libraries where you can go have internet access, but they're not, I think they're not adequate for, 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 for like online education to happen effectively. Um, and also a lot of people don't live in, in housed environments, which also conduces to academic success. I mean, they're often housed with like big families um, and they're not, they're not a quiet space they can stay by themselves. So I think that for South Africa, I mean, for first world countries might be different where there's a lot more, like everyone has really high speed internet and everyone has their own rooms, whatever it is. But I think for South Africa, um, I think for South Africa, like physical presence on campus is a necessity for people that want to get higher education for a while. I think that our infrastructure doesn't support it not being a necessity. Um, and I think that people do need to be in, in accommodation that is more like ac academically conducive. So I think there's still a need for that in my opinion. Um, I also think that there's a lot of status still in having like a high education in South Africa. I think that maybe we've seen like in, you know, in America and Europe right now, um, people kind of aren't as like, they don't see it as glamorous having a degree um, because with the whole like rise of tech right now, and there's like very glamorous tech startup scene where people are dropouts, you know, famously dropouts or famously not saying and do online learning. Um, but I think it's the case in South Africa. I think that having qualifications is still like highly, highly regarded here. So I think, from, from, you know, from our perception and from our like analysis of what's going on, I think that it still will be a necessity. I think it still will happen. Um, but that being said, I think that because everyone is so cautious about what Corona will mean, you know, obviously we've, we've flattened COVID a lot, but you know, if we were to open up the campuses again, what that would mean. I mean, I'm not a health expert, of, of course, also I can't comment on that, but it seems that young people don't really get affected by coronavirus. Um, but of course there's the issue of comorbidity and because that's a really high AIDS rate and quite a high TV rate that does play into account there also. So I think in terms of opening the campuses, there are so many moving factors here, but at the end of the day, like everyone does have to live somewhere. And so like having accommodation, people have to like, you know, people need a place to stay. So there's a lot of uncertainty around there, but I think that we think that we still have a business um, based on the research we've done. And like speaking to like our mentors and our advisors, we think that we think that landlords will still have a business. They still have people to rent out their rooms. We think that the universities will remain, will remain a constant. Um, the, the one uncertainty is when that'll happen. Um, the university right now is supposed to open in September. Um, whether that happens in September or it happens in October or it doesn't happen this year, it's something that I think no one knows yet. I think not even the minister knows that because he's waiting to see how infections will, will, will ramp up, you know, as we kind of like lower the, the, lower the lockdown. There's still such a difference between demand and supply in the market that even if there's, there's a, a, a demand drop, the supply is still going to be um, below that demand, I suppose. I um, mean, parts here, right down here, is people still want the campus experience. You know, people coming out of out of school, matric, they, I mean, they aspire to leave home and go live on a campus somewhere mm -hmm. with their friends and study. I mean, it's, that aspiration is not going to just disappear because uh, they can suddenly learn on a laptop. So, absolutely, and most students can't also. Most students that have laptops. So, I think that the government has very clear goals, like you know, regarding education in in, Af in South Africa, and like those goals require them, you know, require students to be at, at university. So Corona has changed a lot, but I don't think it's changed the need for education. Like that'll always kind of be, that'll always kind of be like a, a constant. So the question to finish off here, and it's a good question from Joshua is, and what are the traits you've honed or learned that would be essential to your success? So example, some of the habits you've sort of um, taken on board. Mm. I think confidence is a big one. I think that for some reason, we all kind of like taught to doubt ourselves, you know, at like at school or whatever it is, we're all kind of told to like, be like shy and cautious and like, and ask permission. Um, I think the biggest thing is like confidence and like having no scar. Don't ask permission, just do it. You know, <laughs> like don't wait for everyone to say it's a good idea. Like, I mean, I took the idea of Digs Connect to like loads of people before I really started. Everyone's like, that's a terrible idea. What do you mean? It'll never work. People who just use like, you know, property 24, like, this is like ridiculous. And everyone told me it was like terrible, I did it anyways. So I think like the confidence to kind of like, the, the courage of your convictions, you know, to back yourself and believe that if you've got the, like, if you've got a vision and you believe in it and you think it'll work, then just follow through on that. And to just do it anyways. And if people say no to you, just do it anyways. Like when I said to UCT first, when I still believe in the idea originally, I was like, you guys want this website. Like I can make it, like give it to you as like for you guys to manage. And they're like, we don't need this. What do you mean? This is like, we have like posters up on the wall or they just wouldn't even meet with me and they keep saying no so I just did it myself 
you know? Mm. I think, yeah, and I wish I'd just done it sooner. I wish I hadn't waited for permission. I hadn't waited for someone to give me the go ahead or keep needing everyone to say it was a good idea. So just doing it is a big thing, confidence. Um, other thing I would say is teamwork <laughs> is a big one. Like I was always like of the belief that I could do things myself. Like, you know, I don't need anyone else and I'm going to just like figure it out for myself and I'm going to code this. I'm going to do the marketing. I'm going to figure it out. I think that like kind of letting go of some things, you know, is important. Like realizing that actually someone else's opinion or someone else's way of doing this could be better than yours. So, like in your team, if you really trust them. So once you brought someone on, trusting them to do the job is important. You literally can't do everything yourself. Um, yeah, I would try and always like do everything and then you just can't actually get anything done because like you'll move so slowly if you do things one at a time. But once you have more people in your team and you kind of like divide the tasks up, you can just move a lot faster. Like, so that's a big one also, it's like the, the power of teamwork. And the last thing is, I don't know, I think changes are so gradual in a way, you know, kind of like there's, there's so, it's not really moments where you kind of like, you wake up and you're like this new person, you're suddenly just like, ha ah, ha, I'm amazing now. I'm sorry if that day to happen. <laughs> But it's, it's kind of like this gradual thing. And I think that that gradual change is wrought through habits. It's like, it's the same habits of like, it's kind of like water against a rock, you know, you chip away at that. And, and it's every day, you know, it's getting a little better every single day. You wake up every day and some days you just want to like lie in bed, but you like get out of bed because you know, you need to do that. You get to the office, you sit there and you're looking at a wall of emails and you're just like, oh my gosh, but you get through that. And that taught me like discipline, you know, and then getting up every day to my consistency. Um, but like a little bit every single day and just like a tone in, you know, listening to other people and not kind of just like talking over them, talking like teamwork and actually like stepping back sometimes. Um, the confidence was a thing that you learned day by day where I realized actually I could make this work if I kept, if I believed in myself. Um, so I think it's about like setting in the right, the right habits where you, you kind of like, you listen to people, you're consistently trying, you're getting better every day, you're trying harder, you're, you're doing things like, you know, that make you feel scared, but you know it's the right thing to do. Um, yeah, I think that's been the biggest change of all. Like change is, it's relatively slow, but like it's, it, it's so, it's so deeply entrenched then if you do it like that. It's so hard to break those habits if you have the same thing every day. Like I think you're, you're taking the right steps in the right, in the right direction. I think that's almost unstoppable then. Awesome. So I'm going to um, summarize for you there is, is um, keep moving, uh, teamwork and believing in yourself are, are some big factors, and huge factors, I think, no matter what business you're in. So, mm -hmm. so Andre, that's, um, we've done almost a good hour and a half, actually. So, uh, no, it's awesome. And, and uh, I really appreciate your time. And thanks for spending time on the conversation with me and, and sort of sharing your insights and your sort of your learnings. Um, I think uh, a lot of people take a lot of value, no matter what they're doing, and whether they're in normal jobs or, or um, building their own businesses. Uh, so I really appreciate that. And, and uh, I mean, yeah, I really wish you guys well. It's, you've got an exciting business, a business I think can... Um, take over Africa and, and, and the world um, in student accommodation, most certainly. Um, and I'll thank definitely you. keep an eye on the, your innovation. Thank you. And thank you for hosting us also. I think that having these chats is so important. Like, there's nothing more important than South Africans realizing that we can change the world. You know, we can build the solutions that we need. So I think this is such a cool initiative and I'm so excited for like, yeah, everyone watching this, everyone who will see this and what you're doing. I think that it's, it's so cool. You know, like as long as we keep trying, we keep doing it and keep having hope that we can do cool shit, which we can do. Like, this country is, yeah, it's got, it's got a really, really bright future. It's awesome. Well, um, in, in uh, your own words, um, keep doing cool shit and uh, we'll uh, <laughs> speak to you all soon. Thank you very much. Yeah.